Good afternoon. Making sure that this is loud enough. Good afternoon. Today is the 8th of September 2020 and I am now starting chapter 8 of a book called Prelude to the Landing on Planet Earth. I've read all other chapters in previous uploads. It is written by, it was written by Stuart Holroyd and it is a fascinating journey of three people, a doctor and a aristocrat and a medium, Phyllis Schlemmer, who met coincidentally, <laughs> synchronistically, because they had a job to do on planet Earth in the 70s and 80s. This is, uh, I think this is their first journey they're taking, and uh, the last patches were, chapters were about uh, the end of 1974 and the beginning of 1975. Chapter 8 entitled Walking on Eggs. Tom speaks for the Council of Nine, so but you need to read the pre listen to the previous ones or download it. Of all Tom's predictions, the one that there would be a brink of war situation in the Middle East over the Passover Easter holidays at the end of March 1975 is the second most impressive. I will be writing about this most impressive prediction later in this chapter. At the time it was made, the world's press and politicians were expressing optimistic views of the Middle East situation, for Kissinger was just embarking on another peace-seeking mission, and hopes ran high that he would be able to persuade the Israelis to cede some of their strategic 1973 gains in Sinai in exchange for an Egyptian non-aggression agreement. Nobody foresaw at the beginning of March that Kissinger, Kissinger's mission would be a total failure and that before the end of the month, the Arabs and the Israelis would be making missile-rattling pronouncements. On the 24th of March, 75, Kissinger returned to Washington, a disappointed man, and a Times headline asked, Has Mr. Kissinger, has Dr. Kissinger made his last stand as the American Superman? Correspondents from Egypt quoted the foreign minister as saying that the breakdown had brought the Middle East to a dim point due to Israel arrogance and a new military conflict could not be excluded. And from Israel came the report that the Prime Minister accused Egypt of making exorbitant demands and causing the collapse of Dr. Kissinger's peace mission with the aim of facilitating its war deployment. There were reports of Egyptian troop movements on the east bank of Suez and of a massive troop build-up on the west bank. With three days to go before the critical time predicted by Tom in the communications of 7th of March, the situation seemed quite as dire as, as he had said it would be. It is worth noting in passing that two earlier predictions could be taken as referring to the events of these days. On the November the 9th, 1974, Tom had said that within six months Kissinger would have problems and there would be attempts to discredit and remove him. And before they had left Israel in December, Tom had told them that the situation was now stabilized and would hold for three months. The intervening three months hadn't exactly been peaceful. In January, skirmishing on the Israel-Lebanon skirmishing on the Israel-Lebanon border had escalated into what the Times called a mini war, when the Lebanese army had apparently lent support to the Al Fatah guerrillas operating from Lebanese territory. Then. There had been an audacious and suicidal terrorist attack from the sea on at Tel Aviv Hotel, and the Israelis had learned from one prisoner they took that Israel that Syria was involved in this operation. Border raids and terrorist activities were everyday news, and by March there was a widespread feeling that the Kissinger Initiative was the last hope for peace. And Richard, John, and Phyllis arrived in Israel on the 12th of March, 75. They picked up their hired car at the airport and drove a leisurely speed over the rocky but green hills of Judea and through the Arab towns of Ramallah, Nablus, Tubas and Jenin to their destination Nazareth, where they checked into the best hotel they could find, a place that managed to be at once modern and seedy. The physical impressions of the 
sprawling town of Nazareth, which today is predominantly Arab, were as unfathomable as their impression of the hotel, and they remarked how disappointed modern pilgrims must be to find the hometown of their Lord and Saviour so squalid. But they were neither on a pilgrimage nor a holiday, and their instructions were to spend three days in this place, the nearest sizable town to Megiddo, so they resigned themselves to the discomfort. Tom had said that they should be at Megiddo on the 13th of March, so after an early breakfast they drove the 12 miles across the plain to the historic site. They spent the morning strolling over the mound, exploring it and collecting shards of ancient pottery which lay in profusion on the ground. They also collected specimen of a curious black stone which, Andretta said, was to be found only at Megiddo. They wandered around separately for some time, then found themselves together at the so-called Cananine Alta, Cananite Alta, the circular platform of rough stones situated in the middle of the deepest excavation and from which there is a panoramic view across the plain to the hills of Galilee. Here they were sufficiently undisturbed by tourists to hold a brief communication, which they did seated upon the altar. Tom complimented them on so precisely locating the nucleus of the energy center of Megiddo and said that the middle of the altar was the core of a giant wheel that vibrates in 12 directions. And Richard asked, was the Nazarene aware of this energy center? Yes, Tom said, it was what fed him. It was from where the light came to keep him alight. Andreja asked about the black rocks and was given an explanation of their origin. We go back to a time of 10 to 12,000 of your BC. It was the time of the collapse of the continents upon which the Altians existed. There were great explosions and there also came from the sky the wrath of those that were in utter disgust at the perversion of the Altians, that's the Atlanteans. Part of this came and landed upon the area of Megiddo and made a giant crater, which then created a giant natural spring. There was a bombardment from the sky and the natives of the area were fearful, but because it had created water, it represented those that had given them life. It represented those that had given them life. Tom stressed the importance of their holding their three o'clock meditation session, synchronized with that of the troops back at Osinning at this spot for the next three days. And tomorrow, the 14th, he said, was going to be a particularly demanding day, for the Israelis were planning a preemptive attack, a simultaneous foray into Lebanon and Syria, and it was important that the plan should not be put, not be put into action. If you may, upon the center of Megiddo, if you may be upon the center of Megiddo by 12 o'clock and be quiet between them and your three o'clock meditation, it will suffice, he said. But after their three days of charging up, as it were, at the power center of Megiddo, they should tour the northern frontier areas to spread the energy into Lebanon and Syria. When they had completed this brief communication, the trio left Megiddo and went to the nearby town of Afula to get a meal. In the afternoon, they returned to the power center for the three o'clock meditation. Then they drove to Mount Tabor by way of a narrow and winding road bordered with rocks, immense cacti and other shrubbery. They were able to drive to the plateau at the top of the mountain where a long avenue of cypresses, cypresses leads up to the front of the Franciscan monastery, a modern building skillfully integrated with the ruins of an earlier monastery. They stood a while and enjoyed the breathtaking views. To the east, the Lake of Galilee and the towns of Tiberias and beyond them, snow-capped Mount Hermon, and to the west, the vast plains that were pla patterned and colored with cultivation. They went into the church, which was silent and ice cold, and there they prayed for a while and then looked at mosaic portraying the biblical event associated with this place, the transfiguration of Jesus. Beneath the mosaic, John noticed, there was a window with some curious symbolism in stained ink, a torch, a triangle, and two peacocks. He asked a monk, who turned out to be an American, what the symbolism meant. But the monk was unable to enlighten them. Back at their hotel in Nazareth, they heard a communication that evening in which they elicited some of Tom's fullest and most coherent statement on the subject of cosmology 
philosophy and theology. It began with Andretja asking the question, are the nine the ultimate source of knowledge, wisdom and power in the universe? Tom answered, the nine together are what you would call the infinite intelligence. Yes, well, we speak of the fountainhead or the unmoved mover, Andretja said. And in our theology, the idea is common that God initiated the thought, but the action is always carried out by others, by subsidiaries. That's correct. It is by the civilizations. I see, and didn't you indicate at one time that there are 24 civilizations? No, there are many, but there are 24 heads of civilizations. It might be compared to your Congress. John put in a question. And are all these working on the positive side? Tom had to remind him of one of the basic tenets of the philosophy of the nine. Sir John, the positive and the negative must be blended to make it whole. As we have explained to you, to be positive without sense is not good. They are the balanced civilizations. When you speak of positive, Sir John, refer to it as balanced positive. Ah, okay, I think we understand that part. To take Jehovah as an example, I assume that he is one of the 24 and under him is his civilization, Hoover. Yes, and there would be, like a pyramid, many civilizations under that. Okay, now let's take human existence. Where do human beings come from? Why do they come here? And where do they go? All beings and species come from us, Tom answered. Your question, who am I? Where did I come from and where am I going are asked by all and the answer is that all species and all beings are particles of us. And they go through many existences before they reach Earth. Is that not so? It may be, but remember the planet Earth is not so evolved. So there is a regular sequence through which they must go before they come to this planet and through which they go after leaving it? No, Tom says. It depends on the needs of the soul. There are level of, levels of intelligence and there are levels of consciousnesses. And some see souls need more than others. Visualize a gigantic electric spark and smaller sparks coming off this gigantic electric spark. Each of these sparks would be part of the gigantic spark, which is us, and each would either die or continue to grow. Some would create a fire and some would grow slowly. It would depend on the ambition of the spark. Now, when that spark circles through Earth and achieves its full growth, Andretta said, does it go through other civilizations or does it return directly to you? It must continue for millions of years, Tom answered, but it cannot continue if it stays upon the planet Earth. If you recall, in a previous conversation, we have explained to you that the planet Earth is the only planet in the universe that has upon it the variety of animals and the variety of plants. It is, of all the planets in the universe, what you would call the most beautiful because of its great variety. This attracts the souls and they have desires to remain upon it. In other civilizations, the souls have feelings and all the qualities that you have, but existence is more physical upon the planet Earth. John said, if I might ask a very broad question, what is the soul's purpose in existing in all those different civilizations? Tom began, if a soul becomes what you would call perfect, then it is, he stopped abruptly and said, if we explain this to you, Sir John, you may think we are cannibals. John and Andretta laughed and Andretta said, well, I think you know us well enough to know that we won't jump to erroneous conclusions. Let put the question, let's put the questions this way. If we had to tell a human being what the purpose of life is, you may tell them what has been told to you, what has been told to them many times, but has not been clearly understood, that the purpose of their existence is to return whence they came. In other words, to be swallowed up by you, said John with a laugh, now appreciative, appreciating the cannibals reference. And while they are on this earth, with all its problems, Andretta said, what is it they can best do in order to return to the source? Tom, if they treat all as they would desire to be treated, 
If they walk in dignity and neither attempt to remove from another nor permit to be removed from themselves their dignity, and if they have love for their fellow men and for all that they come in touch with, this, in turn, sends love to us. So in essence, Andretta said, we may say that God feeds on this kind of nectar, this love, yes. And is this love totally immaterial? Is it something that has no material or physical existence? It is an energy. It is not something you may hold in your hand. It is a spark that emanates and grows and becomes a shining sun and then returns to us. John said, in the future, we are likely to be asked, what is God? And of course, we have some idea ourselves, but we would like to be able to give consistent and understandable answers to those who ask. Sir John, what is God to you? Tom asked. Well, there are various ways I could answer that. I could say that God is the nine or is a unified intelligence. Tom interrupted to take up John's last phrase and expand it to a unified infinite intelligence supported by pure love and which grows with pure love. That was a conversation stopper. John and Adrija were both silent for a while. They took in this elegant and elliptical definition. Then Andretja resumed the questioning. Now, how do the other creatures on the planet Earth fit into this cosmic scheme of things? They have more love and more understanding of us than many humans, Tom said. And do they come also back as sparks directly without having to go through a human form? They are never of a human form. They are upon the planet Earth in order to make the souls there ask, what created this? How did this come to be? They are, they are here to jog the mind. Do you understand? Yes, I think so, Andretta said. For example, at Megiddo today, we were watching two hawks. They were mating on the wing and they were incredible and beautiful. And we wondered about them. They live in such freedom and apparently love and, Tom said, it is the purest love. Yes, so would their soul spark if it achieved perfection to directly back to you and go directly back to you? Our doctor, you must understand that of all the creatures that exist upon the planet Earth, only man and a pop voice has an intelligent soul that is a spark of us. I see. So when we work with pop voices, as we expect to be in the future, we are to consider that they have souls equivalent to human beings. Tom, their souls have grown stronger and with more light than many human souls. They only desire to help the human race. John asked, have some souls now in human beings ever been incarnated as dolphins? Is that possible? Yes, but only in that relationship and never in an animal. If you had the desire to come as a pop voice, you could do so. And Reggie said, that raises an interesting question. You have told us that after the destruction of Atlantis or Altea, many souls chose to return as dolphins. But did dolphins and pop voices have intelligent souls before that time? Yes, Tom said. So I take it that in dolphins, as in humans, there are souls at different stages of development? Yes. And are there any of what we might call advanced pop voices in this area of Israel and Egypt at this time? Tom, I must consult. And after a pause, he continued. Altia has said that arrangements are being made for them to be in all areas so that men might recognize them for what they are. You understand that they, like you, are in service, but it is difficult for them to perform true service without the link with human beings. Yes, well, when this crisis is over, we must see what we can do to establish and strengthen those links, Andrei just said. This was the most sustained discursive communication of this period for throughout the next few days, Tom was chiefly concerned with the political situation. The trio followed his instructions to be at Megiddo from noon the next day in order to preempt the preemptive strike into, strike into Lebanon and Syria that the Israels were alleged to be planning. In the evening, Andreja asked Tom whether their efforts had produced the desired effect and Tom said that they had. A decision was made at 2.30. There was a vote and it was finalized within the hour. But remember, there are among the Israelis 
as among their enemies, those that are fanatics. And is there a danger that these fanatics will be able to reverse the decision made today? Andreja asked. We will alert you if there is a danger of that, Tom said. It is still important for you to go to the north now to prevent those that are fanatics on the other side. Yes, we've made plans to go the day after tomorrow, after we've completed our three days here at Megiddo. Tom said, our major concern is, is if there should be what you would call a mushrooming of acts of aggression by and against the nation of Israel to the point where it would be very difficult for your energies and strength to hold it. So with the belief that their journey would prevent this eventuality, Andreja, John and Phyllis set out from Nazareth in a loaded station wagon on the morning of the 16th of March. They drove west to join the Mediterranean coast road. Then after passing through the picturesque and sleepy towns of Acre and Naharia, climbed by a winding road into the hills of the frontier area. Behind a high double fence of barbed wire lay Lebanon, apparently utterly deserted, except in the valleys where occasionally Arab farmers, farmers were to be seen. The Israeli side of the frontier was fortified with military installations every few miles, and twice they were turned back by soldiers and directed to a parallel road further from the border. By 2.30 they found themselves on Mount Hermon, at a kind of makeshift military, militarized skiing resort with temporary port portable buildings and tanks everywhere. For their three o'clock meditation, the top of Mount Hermon, which commanded sweeping views over Lebanon and Syria, would be, they agreed, the ideal spot. So they took a chairlift up the sky slope and found a secluded place to sit. A mercilessly sharp wind from the east whipped around them and at the end of the meditation, they were all shivering and glad to get back to the chairlift and down to a more hospitable altitude. Further down still they came to a village named Baninas, a place that echoed with a continuous rush of mountain streams, and here in a grove of ancient and gnarled olive trees they attempted to hold a communication. It was a short one, because Tom said that conditions were not favourable, but he had had time to congratulate them on a successful sweep of the north, and that they should communicate at greater length that evening. So they drove in two hours to Tiberias on the Lake of Galilee, where they booked into the Galilee Kinneret, a luxury lakeside hotel. At the beginning of the communication they held that night, after dining and taking a walk around the town, Tom reviewed the effects of their day's work. Throughout the area where you have been this day, you have accomplished a great deal more. We cannot say that we anticipated or planned, and we do not wish to anger those with whom we battle, so we must at this time speak with care. But you accomplished much. We wish you to visualize that as you pass through an area, there spreads and dissipates behind you a bright glowing light that would be similar to a stream. But in truth, it does not dissipate, but reaches over a wide area. Do you understand? Yes, Andreja said, we can visualize it as we would call it a vapor trail. Yes, and this day you have, you have, and, and this day you have with your vapor trails caused the settlement of anger in many, and you have spread a blanket that will keep the passions and the ambitions of those that oppose the nation of Israel under control. And you have done more than this. Within the area through which you have passed, there were spirits that still existed from the history of that area. And because of their ignorance and refusal of understanding, they have created difficulties for those of the nations of Israel and also of the nations of Lebanon and Syria through their strong desires to continue their battles. What you have done is negated the energies of those spirits that are used by those that oppose. You have done a great service because you have opened their minds to see greater things. These were some of the spirits that we have spoken to you about before and that have created a bottleneck in the spirit planes of the planet Earth and through your work, this day, they have been released. Tom said that they should regard the following day as a day of rest. They, would, they should do their meditation as usual at three o'clock if possible, and if they wouldn't be too conspicuous, he said, they should do it either in a small boat on the lake or sitting on the shore with their feet in the water, because water is a great conductor of energy, 
not only in your world, but also in other worlds, and enables them to transmit to you. Syria, which Tom called the nation that is across, meaning on the other side of the lake, was still the most threatening of the Arab nations, they learned. And for the next two days, they should direct their meditation there. Then they should go to the south and work on Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt from the vantage point of Eliad, Eilat, and Sharm el Sheikh, Sharm el Sheikh. The prospects of success in their work were good, but there were going to be some very taxing days ahead, so they should take full advantage of the present opportunity to recuperate their energy. When will be the time of maximum drain on us, Andreja asked. At this time we foresee that it will be between your 26th and 30th of March. It may be that at that time you will be like rags. <laughs> will you repeat that, Andreja said. Did you say rags? Yes, that is limp object, is it not? They laughed at that. Then Andreja returned to the point. Tom had made earlier about water being a great conductor, and he recalled that on many occasions when he had worked with Yuri, for instance, during the Stanford Research Institute investigation, there had been a gathering of clouds and rainfall. Is this the way we received the energy to do the work, he asked. Yes, it's like a giant funnel, Tom said, and today you have created a storm that has passed over Syria, Syria. and in the coming days you will notice other clouds. Yes, we will look for these signs, Andretta said. It is, sign to, it is a sign to you that you are generating on a fusion basis, Tom said. Could you explain that? Of hydrogen. Oh, I see. You mean a hydrogen fusion, fusion reaction? Yes, Altia has said that that is something for you to ponder on. So the next day they took it easy, enjoyed the excellent amenities of the hotel, including the lakeside swimming pool, wrote letters, strolled around the town, paid a visit to the ruins at Capanon, the place where Jesus had begun his ministry, and at three o'clock in the afternoon found a spot beside the lake where a bank and a belt of trees hid them from the road and settled down, seated on rocks and with their feet in the water, for their half-hour meditation. Some twenty minutes had elapsed when a man's voice shouted from the trees behind them, Hey, what you do? When he got no response, the man shouted his question again, then a third time, and Phyllis turned around to see an Arab in European dress standing on the bank above them. He asked, You're praying? Phyllis said they were, and the Arabs asked them, What for? For peace, Phyllis said, and he said, That is good, and walked away. Just a few minutes later, a lone Israeli soldier approached, removed his boots and socks, and sat near them with his feet in the water. When they held a communication later that day, Andretja referred to this incident, and Tom said that the Arab who had spoken to them was a Syrian. Andretja wondered whether the incident signified that there was a possibility that the Arabs and the Israelis would sit down at a place together and work for peace. Tom said that it was indeed possible, but indicated that they would have a lot of work to do before it came to that. Moreover, there was a new cause for concern, there were plans being made to assassinate Dr. Kissinger during his present tour of Middle East capitals, and the event could trigger a full-scale war. That's terrible, Andreja said, and you speak as if it's a foregone conclusion. In your world, nothing is a foregone conclusion, Tom said. We tell you these things so that we may use you. And he instructed them to include Dr. Kissinger in their meditation and prayer so that they could send energy to protect him. You three together are an energy field, he told them, and you are as powerful as the energy of Megadi, Megiddo, or of your home, or of a pyramid. When you are together, we can take from you and weave a cable, and this cable, he said, could be used to protect Kissinger. The talk about energy brought up the subject of the troops at Osinin and the extent to which they were contributing support through their meditation session. Tom said that they were doing quite well, but there were certain disturbances amongst them and they needed to understand the importance of discipline in their work. John said, if they could have a sign from Altia or Hoover, I think it would encourage them. Tell them to watch their clocks, Tom said. John was in the habit of phoning or sinning every other day, and the next time he did so, he received Tom's message. 
When he phoned again two days later after that, Jim Huerta confirmed that the dog plots had started behaving erratically again. The contributions of the troops, Trump said, would probably not be needed after the end of the month and they could make plans to disband them if they wished to. But Alan Dreja, John and Phyllis might be required to extend their stay in Israel. It would depend on the trend of events, but they should be prepared to stay longer than originally planned. And if they wish to make provisional arrangements for their respective partners to join them, they sh could do so. After spending three nights in Tiberias and being assured that their presence and meditations had helped to moderate the more extreme factions in the nation that is across Syria, Andreja, John and Phyllis set out early on March the 20th to drive to the south. They had soon left behind the European lushness of Galilee and entered the Jordan Valley. The heat and humidity rapidly increased as the road, which ran parallel with the Jordan River a mile or so away on the other side of the frontier, fell further and further below the sea level. They had been on the road nearly two hours when they drove through a vast and eerily deserted former refugee town of low mud houses where now only goats roamed the street, beyond which lay the incredible oasis of Jericho, where they took a welcome break. Their instructions from Tom were that they should stop every two hours on their journey for a 15-minute meditation. So they drove the short distance from Jericho to the Dead Sea and held their first session standing in its sticky and still water. There was no water to be found for the second session of the day, for at one o'clock they were in the middle of what the Israelis, Israelis call the Araba, or desert, badlands. But by three they had arrived at their destination, Eliad. Eilat, and were able to hold their third session sitting with their feet in the sea. Across the bay, no more than two miles from where they were, lay the Jordanian port of Akba, and on the Israel side the water was full of swimmers and indolent pleasure boats, while further out a vast military patrol boat sported. Eilat, Eilat, a resort surrounded by desert and with big modern impersonal hotels, all glass and plastic seemed to John a sort of poor man's Las Vegas. They held a communication that evening in a hotel that smelled of fresh paint. It was a fairly brief session, a, si a general situation report from Tom, and advice for each of them on various points, various small points. They retired early and by agreement were at breakfast by seven o'clock the following morning and shortly afterwards ready for the long run down the Gulf of Shamal Sheikh. It was a beautiful drive with an azure sea on either side of them, on one side of them, for a good part of the way, and a stark desert on the other. There was hardly any other traffic in either direction, <coughs> and the only other signs of life were the occasional Bedouin driving or riding camels. They were in Sham or Ophira, as the Israelis have renamed it by noon and they found a town that was a little more than a garrison and a construction site. The only hotel was full and they were recommended to try to get a room at the dry diving centre just outside the town. They, passed, they had passed the place on the way in. It was a low building on the seafront with six dormitory rooms and in order to get privacy they had to pay extra for a whole room to themselves. The heat was intense and they were dusty from the journey through the desert. So as soon as they had settled in, and settled in, Andretja and John went for a swim. They had been told that the coral here was some of the best in the world. So they hired masks and snorkels and spent half an hour observing and marveling at the underworld, underwater world of breathtaking color and variety that contrasted so sharply with the unrelieved sandy monotone of the surrounding desert. Tom's point about Earth being the planet of greatest beauty and variety was certainly illustrated here. But they were not here to marvel. They had work to do at three o'clock, and the map indicated that the best place for their meditation, the place nearest both to Egypt and to Saudi Arabia, was the peninsula of Ras Muhammad, some 50 kilometers away. There was a road only part of the way to Ras Muhammad. The rest was a track across the de desert, marked by little piles of stones every 50 yards or so, but they found their way there in good time and managed to get to the very farthest point of the peninsula to do their meditation. It was a beautiful spot, 
utterly silent and deserted, where the sea washed the shore gently and the heat haze shimmered over the land. They stayed a while after the meditation, bathed and visited the nearby mangrove swam, swamps before, before returning to the drive, diving centre at Cham. They had a communication before dinner that evening in their room. And Richard had to begin by apologising for the noise because there was a generating thundering just outside and somebody in the neighbouring room was playing a radio. But Tom said, we are secure, and asked what questions they had. Well, as you know, we did our meditation facing Egypt and Saudi Arabia today, Andreja said, and it, we'd like to know how effective that was. It was of the greatest effect in creating sense in the leaders of those nations, Tom said. The problem now was going to be to stabilize the leaders in Jerusalem after Kissinger's visit, and to this end they would go through Jerusalem on their way back to the north and hold a meditation as near as possible to the Neset on 23rd of March. Neset. The Kissinger negotiations were not going well and his life was still in danger and the next days were going to be crucial for him so they should continue sending him energy and protection. Andreja had a question on another subject just before they had settled down for this communication they had learned that during the afternoon there had been great excitement at the diving centre because about 20 porpoises had appeared in the bay. This apparently was an unprecedented event so Andretja asked Tom if it had anything to do with their presence. Did you not ask, Tom said? May we say to you, our doctor and Sir John, and you will relate this to our being. We have in the past explained to you many times about your power. We have warned you and we have cautioned you to be careful what you ask. Have we not? Yes, Andretja said. Well, we, ha we have asked you to be of extreme caution with your angers, your displeasures and your despairs because of your power. And it is the same with your happiness, your joy and your enthusiasm. Those creatures heard what you asked and came because of your asking. Should we try and make contact with the purposes tomorrow, Andreja asked. And Tom said that provided they were able to fulfill their instructions for the 23rd, it was up to them how they organized their time. John was keeping a diary all through this period, and I'm now going to quote verbatim his entry for the 22nd of March, 75, for it provides a better background than a second-hand report for the communication they held later that day. I got up early, and as I was keen to get to the Dead Sea that afternoon for the meditation, I insisted on an early start, though Andretja wanted to hang about on the beach till noon, and Phyllis wanted to, to, wanted to talk to the pop voices. Anyway, we got going at 9 a.m. and Phyllis was rather down, so I became frustrated with her. On the way to Eilat, we discussed many things about biblical history, and Andretja had two minor arguments with Phyllis, one about nine cancelling out, and the other about truth and perfection. My thinking goes on much the same lines as Andretja, and I often find Phyllis's non-sequential and non-specific discussions irritating, and I did on this occasion. During the first argument, her earring dematerialized and later reappeared, which, with hindsight, I see was a warning. And during the second, we came upon a couple of Israelis beside a broken down jeep. We stopped only briefly and didn't offer much help, which was a thing we were to hear about more later. We had a slow lunch in Eliot, Eli Eilat and left there at 1, 10, 10 past 1 to attempt to reach the Dead Sea for our 3 p.m. meditation. I drove faster than usual, but quite safely, I thought, and Phyllis slept most of the way, and we reached the Dead Sea at ten minutes to three. We stood in the water for the meditation, and then went to check in at the very touristy Dalai Zoha Hotel at Ein Bocke. Again, Andretja and I went down to the beach to experience floating in the crazy water, which was fun. Then back to the hotel for, the, for a communication, and the bombshell hit us. During the meditation, John had had an unusual experience. He'd heard very clearly a voice saying several times, I'm Dennis Dunsmore, I'm a reporter. He told the others about the experience afterwards, but neither Andretja nor Phyllis had heard it. The bombshell John referred to at the end of his diary entry was the severest reprimand that Tom had ever handed out to them. At the beginning of the communication, 
he said he had a great deal to say to them, but first would answer any question. questions. John asked who Dennis Dunsmore was, and Tom answered, a spirit, a spirit in the area of death. Then Andrea just said they had no important questions and would rather hear what Tom wanted to say to them. And he and John were both amazed and chastened by the long speech that Tom now proceeded to deliver to them. We have given you bouquets when you have deserved them, but we are now going to give you thorns. Today you took upon your physical selves a full situation of great danger. You gave to those that oppose the opportunity to eliminate all three of you completely. We are angry and we will not tolerate this in future. We speak to each of you. Those that oppose what you wait. Those that oppose what you do wait for opportunity, opportunities to eliminate you. Today it has taken the energies of Altia and Hoover and Joseph of Aragon to protect the three of you. Those energies were needed to protect areas for which you have prayed. There is a word in your language that we must use for the first time in speaking to you, and that word is stupid. If we understand that word, it means not thinking and ignorant. Sir John, we will speak to you first, and then we will speak to our doctor and our being Philip. In the future, none of the three of you has the right or the permission to create dangers for the other two. When you take upon yourself the situation of the universe, you take upon yourself also the responsibilities of the universe. You have tested us today in a vehicle that is not of the greatest stability and that could have eliminated all three of you. We gave you signs, but you did not pay attention, and we speak to the three of you. Each of you is as responsible as the others. We have been with you this day because of the necessity to be with you, and you have spoken of many things, and we have listened. You have spoken of truth and you have spoken of perfection. And if you really have the desire to be perfect, we will teach you how perfection is attained on your physical planet Earth. There is but one law to attain a perfection. There are no complexities. It is a very simple law. And it is to treat each and every soul and every animal and every plant as you would desire them to treat you. That is the golden law, the law of the universe. There was upon your journey today a time of necessity for you to stop. We had made arrangements for that. Because of your testing of us, we tested you and we were angry. You do not treat your fellow men as you would desire to be treated, not any of you. You cannot reach the people on your planet if you do not have consideration for them. It is time you learned that if there is an inconvenience, you should accept that inconvenience in order to give you strength and understanding. When you begin to feel that you are of a righteous nature, when you are no longer righteous, then you are no longer righteous. When you begin to feel you are more important than others, then you are no longer important. And when you begin to feel that you may do as you desire to save the world, then you will destroy the world. And today there was another disaster. There was the loss of a dolphin. We admonish the two of you because you did not explain to our being, as we asked you to, about the strength of the three of you. You will now tell our being that in the future arrangements will not be made unless there is a certainty that they will be kept. We will tolerate no more losses and we will not permit any of the three of you to manipulate the other two. You spoke with spirit today, Sir John, because that is where you nearly went. And one of the dolphins made its transition today in its difficulty in waiting for the being. This caused great disturbance with Altia, for you should remember where the dolphins come from. It is true that our being asked the dolphins to come, and you must tell her that in future, if she will not be there, she should send as strongly for them not to come. And you, our doctor, may we ask you, if in your ha heart you can in truth, and you spoke of truth today, say that you did not permit endangerment of your lives. I'm sorry, but I wasn't aware of any danger today at all, Andretta said. Can you say what it was? The car was dangerous. We've asked you before to, pray, to pay attention to the wheels. Sir John, remember, 
that when irritation grows out of proportion, then you have been reached by those that opposed. Today they were able to reach you. You do not know how close you came. John said that he wasn't aware of failing to pay attention to any warnings, and Tamda reminded him that we removed an earring from the being, and not one of you asked why. And Reja asked whether in future warnings couldn't whether future warnings couldn't be clearer and quite unambiguous, for instance, like the car horn suddenly sounding. Tom had to consult about that one, and after a pause, he reported, The council has said that you are asking us to do for you things that you should have the sense to do yourself, and that if we make that arrangement for you, it will be the same as making a law, and it is not good to depend upon a law, which was consistent with their frequently expressed attitude, attitude towards human free will, but a little iron, ironical coming at the end of a harang, harang in which Tom had laid down the law as never before. John and Andreja discussed the gist of this communication with Phyllis when she came out of trance, and that night a rather subdued and thoughtful trio of world savers went to their bed in Galay Zuha Hotel at Ein Bock. I finished the first part of chapter 8 uh, herewith at page 287. And we'll continue. And I have time, it's very warm. <laughs>